Chapter Three of Explorers and Travelers by Adolphus W. Greeley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter Three, Jonathan Carver, the Explorer of Minnesota. Throughout the bloody series of French and Indian wars which ravaged the frontier settlements of America during the first half of the 18th century, France maintained secure possession of the regions of the Great Lakes and the basin of the Upper Mississippi. The successful campaign of the gallant Wolfe against the no less gallant Montcalm ultimately resulted in the termination of French supremacy in these sections and under the treaty of paris in seventeen sixty three canada with all other dominions of france east of the mississippi passed under the control of great britain to this time the english colonists had confined their operations almost entirely to the region of the atlantic coast so when great britain acquired her immense war inheritance the country to the west of the appalachian mountain range was practically an unknown region to its new masters the extension of english settlements toward the interior of the continent was determined on by the english government and the more accessible of the french trading posts in the northwest were immediately occupied maps were few and inaccurate information as to the indians vague and exaggerated while nothing was known as to the resources of the country except that furs were obtainable in large numbers Scarcely were the terms of the treaty promulgated than the enterprising pioneers moved westward and gradually pressed back the Indians nearest the English settlements. A few other men, however, undertook to penetrate the valley of the Mississippi to the very frontier of Louisiana, which remained a French possession. Among these hardy and adventurous Americans, the most enterprising was Captain Jonathan Carver, who was born in Stillwater, New York, in 1732. He was the grandson of William Joseph Carver, one of the earliest of the royal appointments in Connecticut, and his first public service was at the age of 18, when he secured an ensigncy in a Connecticut regiment. In 1757, when Colonel Oliver Partridge raised a battalion of infantry in Massachusetts to serve against Canada, Carver was made a lieutenant therein. Later he served as captain under Colonel Whitcomb, in 1760, and under Colonel Saltonstall in 1762, and participated in the taking of Crown Point and other operations in northern New York. Doubtless, his association with scouts and camp followers, largely consisting of fur traders and frontiersmen, induced a lively interest in their accounts of the western country held by their enemies, the Indian and the Frenchman. Certain it is that Carver acquired such ideas of the extent, fertility, natural wealth, and possibilities of the great and unknown West as fired his adventurous spirit with a firm determination to solve the important geographical problems connected therewith. His objects, he states, were to gain knowledge concerning the Indian tribes to the west of the Mississippi, to ascertain the natural resources of the country, and to cross the American continent between the 43rd and 46th degrees of north latitude. Ultimately, he contemplated the establishment of a trading post at some suitable point on the Pacific coast. Carver was not ignorant of the great danger involved in such an undertaking, where he was obliged to entrust his life to the mercy of unknown Indians for a prolonged time. Indeed, considering his experiences at the massacre of Englishmen and provincials at Fort Henry, it seems surprising that he would ever trust a savage or a Frenchman. In the campaign of 1757, Carver volunteered to accompany the detachment of 1,500 men which General Webb sent forward to reinforce the garrison at Fort Henry, then anticipating an attack from Montcalm. The garrison, commanded by the gallant Monroe, who resisted until his guns burst and his ammunition was nearly exhausted, surrendered to the combined force of Indians and French under Montcalm, who promised safe conduct and private property. As the English force moved out the next morning, the Indians, inflamed by liquor, song, and dance, butchered the sick and wounded, and then fell upon the helpless captives, of whom there were, according to French accounts, about sixty killed and four hundred robbed and maltreated. Montcalm and Levi, to their credit, though too late, made heroic personal efforts which mitigated the horrors of the situation. Among the unfortunates was Carver, who, robbed and stripped by the savages, appealed to a French sentry for protection only to be repelled with abuse. 
Realizing finally that to remain quiet was to meet certain death, Carver and a few others attempted to escape by breaking unarmed through the surrounding lines of Indian fiends. In this desperate effort for life, Carver was twice wounded, badly beaten, seized by two Indians, and led away to death, which he escaped by the appearance of a British officer in full uniform, who was such a prize that his captors left Carver to secure a more valuable victim. Profiting by the respite, Carver fled to the nearest woods, where, exhausted and nearly naked, he concealed himself in a thicket until night. For three days he wandered through the densest part of the forest, suffering tortures from travel under such conditions, often in danger of recapture and without food, until he reached, in a nearly exhausted condition, the English settlements. An attempt at transcontinental exploration was then looked on as foolhardy and visionary in the extreme, even to those friends of Carver who never deserted him. One of these, Dr. Letsom, wrote in the third edition of Carver's Travels, fifteen years after the journey, as follows. He suggested an attempt by land across the northwest parts of America, and actually drew a chart of his proposed route for effecting his project, which, however visionary it may now be deemed, affords at least a proof of the enterprising spirit of Carver. Unmoved by the sneers of his critics, and undeterred by recollections of Indian cruelty and perfidy, Carver arranged the details of his journey at his private expense, and in June 1766 he quitted Boston, and traveling by the way of Albany and Niagara, reached his headquarters, Michilimackinac, now known as Mackinac. Here he made definite arrangements for his serious work of exploration. At this time, English traders extended their journeys to Prairie du Chien for the purpose of purchasing furs from Indians rendezvousing there, and with one of these parties, Carver was to travel, relying on the governor of Mackinac to forward supplies to St. Anthony. Leaving the fort September 3rd and traveling by canoe, he reached the islands of the Grand Traverse and there spent one night. One of the chiefs, to whom a present was given, made, on Carver's departure, the following prayer, which is worthy of reproduction as a specimen of Indian eloquence. May the great spirit favor you with a prosperous voyage. May he give you an unclouded sky and smooth waters by day, and may you lay down by night on a beaver blanket to uninterrupted sleep and pleasant dreams, and may you find continual protection under the calumet of peace. Carver followed the route of Joliet and Marquette through Green Bay and up Fox River to the great town of the Winnebagoes, where he found the Indians presided over by a queen instead of a sachem. Carver speaks of the extreme richness of soil and abundance of cultivated products and wild game, mentioning grapes, plums, Indian corn, beans, pumpkins, squashes, watermelons, and tobacco from cultivation, fish from the lake, wild fowl so abundant that frequently the sun would be obscured by them for some minutes together, while deer, bears, and beavers were very numerous. The usual portage was made by him from the Fox to the Wisconsin River, into which his canoes were launched on the 8th of October. Seven days carried him to Prairie du Chien at the junction of the Wisconsin and Mississippi, which was at that time a town of some 300 families and had become a great trading mart for the adjacent tribes, who assembled in great numbers annually in the latter part of May. At Prairie du Chien, Carver parted with the traders, who were to winter at that point, and, obtaining a Canadian as interpreter and a Mohawk Indian as a servant, he purchased a canoe and on October 19th, proceeding up the Mississippi, he fell in with a straggling band of Indians which barely failed of plundering him. November 1st brought him to Lake Pepin, near which he discovered what appeared to be the remains of extended entrenchments, centuries old, as he thought, but which are now known to be Indian mounds, probably erected as sites for their wigwams, so as to keep them above the annual overflow and inundation. The coming of winter and the forming of river ice obliged him to quit his canoe opposite the mouth of the St. Peter, or Minnesota River, whence by land he reached the falls of St. Anthony on November 17, 1766, probably the first white American to visit them. The noise and appearance of the falls of St. Anthony impressed Carver very strongly, and his account of them is worthy of reproduction in view of the changes that have taken place within the past 130 years.
This amazing body of waters, which are about 250 yards over, form a most pleasing cataract. They fall perpendicularly about 30 feet, and the rapids below, in the space of 300 yards more, render the descent considerably greater, so that when viewed at a distance, they appear to be much higher than they really are. In the middle of the falls stands a small island about 40 feet broad and somewhat longer on which grow a few cragged hemlock and spruce trees, and about halfway between this island and the eastern shore is a rock lying at the very edge of the fall, in an oblique position that appears to be about five or six feet broad and thirty or forty long. Leaving the falls, Carver proceeded up the Mississippi to the mouth of the St. Francis, the farthest of Hennepin, in 1680, discovering on the way Rum and Goose Rivers. Warned by the severity of the cold that winter was fast coming on, Carver returned to his canoe at the mouth of the Minnesota River and decided to explore that stream, of which only the lower portion had ever been visited, by Le Sur in 1700. Following the Minnesota about 200 miles, he reached, on December 7th, the winter camp of a large tribe of Indians, about 1,000 in number, who were designated by Carver as the Naudowesi, Santees. Advancing boldly, with his calumet of peace fastened to the prow of his canoe, he was received in a friendly manner. After the usual smoking of the pipe of peace, during which he says the tent was nearly broken down by the crowd of savages, who, as a rule, had never seen a white man, he was treated with great respect. Among these Indians, Carver passed the winter, filling in his five months' stay by hunting and other Indian amusements. From the Indians, he learned that the St. Lawrence, the Mississippi, and the Bourbon, the Red River of the North, had their sources within thirty miles of each other. This led to the natural but erroneous opinion that Carver had reached the highest land of North America, when in reality he was at an elevation of only 1,200 feet. Carver also spoke of the Oregon, or the River of the West, as having its sources somewhat farther to the west. This is the first time that the word Oregon appears in literature, and Carver gives no account of its meaning. The Indians had traditions as to the extreme plentifulness of gold to the west of the Shining Mountains, of which our explorer says, on the strength of Indian reports, The mountains that lie to the west of St. Peter are called the Shining Mountains, from an infinite number of crystal stones of an amazing size with which they are covered, and which, when the sun shines full upon them, sparkle so as to be seen at a very great distance. Carver's enthusiasm and interest in the West led him to make the following striking prediction, which time has fully justified. He says, This extraordinary range of mountains is calculated to be more than 3,000 miles in length, without any very considerable intervals, which, I believe, surpasses anything of the kind in the other quarters of the globe. Probably in future ages they may be found to contain more riches in their bowels than those of Hindustan and Malabar or then are produced on the golden coast of Guinea, nor will I accept even the Peruvian mines. To the west of these mountains, when explored by future Columbuses or Raleighs, may be found other lakes, rivers, and countries, full fraught with all the necessaries or luxuries of life, and where future generations may find an asylum, whether driven from their country by the ravages of lawless tyrants, or by religious persecutions, or reluctantly leaving it to remedy the inconveniences arising from a superabundant increase of inhabitants, whether, I say, impelled by these, or allured by hopes of commercial advantages, there is little doubt but their expectations will be fully gratified in these rich and unexhausted climes. Carver described the valley of the Minnesota as a most delightful country, abounding with all the necessities of life, which grow spontaneously. Fruit, vegetables, and nuts were represented as being particularly abundant, and the sugar maple grew in amazing numbers. In April 1767, the Santees descended the Minnesota in order, among other things, to bury their dead near a remarkable cave on Lake Pepin, known to the Indians as the dwelling of the Great Spirit. Finding that supplies had not been sent to the falls of St. Anthony, Carver returned to Prairie du Chien in order to get sufficient stores to enable him to reach Lake Superior, whence he hoped to be able to cross the continent from Grand Portage. Obtaining such supplies, he proceeded up the Mississippi to the Chippeway River, 
and after ascending to its head made portages to the st croix and reached lake superior possibly by the river now known as the bois brule from this point carver in his canoe skirted the coast of lake superior to the grand portage where he awaited the arrival of the hudson bay or northern traders from whom he anxiously hoped to obtain supplies that would enable him to journey west but he was destined to disappointment as nothing could be obtained from them carver coasted around the north and east borders of lake superior and arrived at the falls of st marie the beginning of october having skirted nearly twelve hundred miles of the shores of lake superior in a birch canoe the sault st marie was then the resort of the algonquin indians who frequented the falls on account of the great numbers of whitefish that fill the waters particularly in the autumn when the fish leaves the lakes in order to spawn in shallow running waters in november seventeen sixty seven carver arrived at mackinac having as he says been sixteen months on this extensive tour travelled nearly four thousand miles and visited twelve nations of indians living to the west and north his picture of detroit on his return in seventeen sixty eight is of retrospective interest the town of detroit contains upward of one hundred houses the streets are somewhat regular and have a range of very convenient and handsome barracks with a spacious parade at the south end on the west side lies the king's garden belonging to the governor which is very well laid out and kept in good order the fortifications of the town consists of a strong stockade made of round piles fixed firmly in the ground and lined with palisades these are defended by some small bastions on which are mounted a few indifferent cannon of an inconsiderable size just sufficient for its defense against the indians or an enemy not provided with artillery the garrison in time of peace consists of two hundred men commanded by a field officer who acts as chief magistrate under the governor of canada in the year seventeen sixty two in the month of july it rained on this town and the parts adjacent a sulphurous water of the colour and consistency of ink some of which being collected in bottles and wrote with appeared perfectly intelligible on the paper and answered every purpose for that useful liquid soon after the indian wars already spoken of broke out in these parts i mean not to say that this incident was ominous of them notwithstanding it is well known that innumerable well-attested instances of extraordinary phenomena happening before extraordinary events have been recorded in almost every age by historians of veracity i only relate the circumstance as a fact of which i was informed by many persons of undoubted probity and leave my readers as i have heretofore done to draw their own conclusions from it it is beyond question that certain chapters of carver's work supplementary to his account of his personal explorations and especially devoted to indians and to the natural history of the northwest are practically translations of the accounts of charlevoix hennepin and particularly of la Hontan it does not appear from the first part of the work that carver was a man endowed with these powers of observation and assimilation which are essential traits for the successful traveller and author when the brief recital of his personal travels is examined it seems difficult to determine on what grounds his truthfulness has been questioned by a few hostile critics his story is simple and straightforward devoid of boastfulness free from any exaggeration as to his personal prowess and the statement that he passed a winter of five months in the valley of the upper minnesota is in my opinion worthy of entire credence fortunately however evidence of the most convincing character exists as to carver's residence among the naudawises or santees the exhaustive bibliography of the Siouan languages by mr james c pilling indicates that carver is the first author who ever published a vocabulary of the santee tongue and its length eight pages renders it evident that it was an original compilation which must have required considerable time and patience the importance of carver's charts and journals at that time was evident to the lords commissioners of trade and plantations in england to whom carver was referred when praying for reimbursement of his expenses carver appeared before the board and after an examination was granted authority to publish his papers later after carver had as he says disposed of them and they were nearly ready for the press an order was issued from the council board requiring him to immediately turn in all the originals of his charts 
journals, and other papers relative to his discoveries. Meanwhile, interest in the extension of English influence into the interior of North America was waning steadily with the growing conviction that the colonies would establish their independence, and the government had no mind to reimburse an enterprising American, even though he remained loyal. Carver was reduced gradually to the greatest straits, was compelled to sell his book for a pittance, and finally his end hastened by lack of proper food and suitable attendance, died in the direst poverty in London, January 13, 1780. His own generation could best judge as to the timeliness and importance of Carver's exploration, and as to the value of the information set forth in his book of travels. Suffice it to say that no less than twenty-three editions of this book have appeared in four languages. This, too, at a time when the War of Independence naturally destroyed current interest in the extension of English settlements in the interior of North America. Explorations, however, are wisely esteemed by posterity according to the results which flow therefrom in the shape of definite additions to the knowledge of the world or in the more important direction of disclosing lands suitable for colonization. In this latter manner, the exploration of Jonathan Carver and the accounts of his travels had an important influence. They first brought into popular and accessible form information and ideas concerning the interior parts of North America which before had been practically inaccessible to the general public of England and America. Twenty-five years after this journey toward the Shining Mountains and Oregon, the River of the West, the ultimate scheme of Carver found its justification in the success of Alexander Mackenzie, a young Scotchman who was the first white man to cross the continent of America to the north of Mexico. And yet, ten years later, Lewis and Clark were dispatched on their famous expedition, which explored the valley of the Columbia where in 1810, under the energetic management of John Jacob Astor, arose the trading post of Astoria, thus turning into reality the dreams and aspirations of Jonathan Carver, the soldier and explorer. End of chapter 3. Recording by William Tomko.